Welcome to the second episode in my series on air painting for modelers. In this video, I want to explore the options for air painting tools that are most suitable for material application over broad areas of our models, such as overall color, clear, or primer. Their primary function is to apply the smoothest and thinnest possible overall coat of material, laying down the optimal base coat or top coat, and ultimately the make or break scale surface finish. To understand the value of using a large pattern or air painting tool and choose the right one for scale modeling, it's necessary to have a good understanding of the process and what we're trying to control. The spray from any air painting tool is obviously a mixture of air and paint, but the amount of each and how they're distributed within the pattern is critical. Consider a typical airbrush with a nozzle size somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 millimeters. The spray pattern is going to look something like this. Looking at a cross section of the pattern at about 4 to 5 inches from the nozzle, you can see that the concentration of wet paint increases towards the center of the pattern. As you move outward, the concentration of paint decreases and the mixture is now becoming predominantly air with dry paint. For the typical use of an airbrush, that's exactly what you want. Move in close, you get a great line. Move out and you get the wonderful fades that only an airbrush can deliver. Perfect for freehand camouflage or weathering. But that's not what we want when we're painting large areas of a model. Here's what happens with a typical airbrush when you're trying to use it for priming or painting an overall color on a model that's larger than maybe a 72nd World War II fighter. You increase the distance to the surface to try and get a little larger pattern. But the pattern at this point has a smaller center portion of wet paint and a larger outer area with a lot of air and dry paint. When we talk in terms of overall coverage, all this airy dry paint is referred to as overspray. It's the same stuff that winds up on the paper, and it causes a rough pebbly surface texture, or in the case of a gloss paint, orange peel, and that's not so wonderful. Each overlapping pass with any air painting tool is just adding more overspray. But because an airbrush has such a small pattern, the result is a rough, uneven surface finish. Both these situations lead to overly thick layers of paint, especially for modelers who layer on subsequent coats of material to fill in the rough surface prior to decaling. So the main objective in situations of overall coverage is a well-atomized mixture of wet paint with a minimum of overspray, resulting in the thinnest and smoothest coat possible. Air painting tools that solve this issue do it with a combination of two elements. First, by providing a greater volume of material. If you're going to increase the size of the pattern and maintain a good concentration of material, then you obviously need more material to spread over the area. Second, the head has to be designed specifically to optimally atomize the greater volume of material. And one of the keywords here is optimally. Remember we're dealing with scale models here. The paint needs to be thin and even. Modelers who are unfamiliar with miniature spray guns sometimes make the mistake of thinking that because they're using a spray gun, they can use a thicker than normal mixture of paint. Their thinking's been skewed because they've been overthinning their paint trying to spray it through too small of an airbrush nozzle. They've become accustomed to allowing the restriction of the airbrush to dictate how they handle the material, when in fact it would be much better to thin the paint properly for application and coverage. A large airbrush or miniature spray gun will allow the freedom to properly thin the material so as to apply the thinnest coat while still maintaining the integrity of the material. There are all sorts of ways of shooting large volumes of not very well atomized material, like with one of these super economy specials, or even your vacuum cleaner. But that doesn't get us the surface finish we need to produce a more scale thickness of paint. A well designed and constructed miniature spray gun will be capable of delivering airbrush atomization over a much larger area while minimizing areas of overspray. Because they all share the same basic form, we frequently use the term miniature spray gun, but there are actually three functional types. Airbrushes, conventional spray guns, and HVLP spray guns. 
Guns like the Iwata RG3 and the Eclipse G6 function more like an airbrush. The RG3 was designed to have a typical airbrush-like round pattern. The adjustable air cap allows for fine-tuning of the atomization and spray pattern to accommodate different air pressure and material combinations. Its function is similar to Iwata's now discontinued HP BE2 airbrush. The Eclipse G6 uses an extremely long tapered needle that helps it deliver very fine airbrush atomization. Yet it has a true adjustable fan cap. This hybrid gun is the only airbrush I know of that has an adjustable fan spray. Guns like the LPH50 and the LPH80 are miniature HVLP guns. HVLP technology is based around air volume rather than higher air pressure. The idea here is that it uses a greater volume of air at a reduced air pressure to minimize overspray and fog. Modern HVLP technology has led to gun designs that provide very good atomization at lower air pressure. HVLP guns generally have a significantly greater CFM requirement, so if you're considering one, Make sure your compressor can supply the air volume necessary, and consider using a larger diameter air hose and fittings to maintain the air volume. Guns like the Eclipse G5 and G3 are smaller versions of a conventional spray gun, using conventional air pressures. They produce a very fine atomization, but because of the increased cap pressure, they produce more overspray and fog than an HVLP gun. Their air volume requirements are less than an HVLP gun, so they can generally function at normal airbrush volumes. Typically, when you use the term spray gun, you're talking about an air painting tool with an adjustable fan pattern cap. The fan pattern of a spray gun is created by a special fan cap that directs air from either side of the round pattern coming from the nozzle. As you increase the air to the fan cap, you increase the air in the mixture as well as the size of the fan. This increases the total air consumption, which reduces the air pressure into the gun, and therefore airflow over the nozzle. Air pressure is always measured at the gun with full airflow and no material flow. Here you can see the pressure drop as the air is increased to the fan cap. This means you may want to increase the air to the gun as you increase the fan spray. The balance between the air at the nozzle and the fan cap needs to be adjusted precisely to avoid these sorts of issues. This is exactly why fixed fan spray attachments used to convert airbrushes offer little benefit in actual performance and may actually be counterproductive by introducing more overspray and fog. Gun gauges are good to have when using a miniature spray gun and pretty much a necessity if you're using an HVLP gun. HVLP guns are designed to operate with a specific air pressure going in to yield a specific cap pressure and provide optimal performance. Special cap pressure gauges are available if you want to really dial in your air pressure. I adjust air pressure first. If it's an HVLP gun, the specific value is indicated by the manufacturer. Then I adjust material flow. If there's an issue with material viscosity, I can sort it out right away. I then dial in the amount of fan spray that I want. Most of the time, you'll see car painters just open the fan spray all the way. That's because they're painting larger, flatter surfaces and need as much coverage as possible. But because our models are so small, that may not always be appropriate. I'll make a test pass or two, and then I'm ready to go. Painting with a miniature spray gun requires a different technique. And just like any technique, it requires some practice. So if you have little to no experience with spray guns, don't just load up your new gun with paint and start spraying that magnum opus model that you've been working on for two years. Take plenty of time playing with material viscosity, material flow, air pressures, fan spray, and as much as anything, get a feel for the distance rhythm, and overlap of each pass. In this regard, it's more demanding than painting with an airbrush because you're putting down more material and maintaining an even wet coat. And since the paint's wet when it hits the model, you'll see significant improvement in overall surface finish. 
If you want to know more specific details about each individual Iwata miniature spray gun that I've found valuable for scale modeling, check out the link in the description below this video.